So good morning. My name is Arun Pneja. I am the Dean of the School of Hospitality Administration, or Shaw, as we call ourselves, at Boston University. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students, a warm welcome to everyone attending the second lecture of our Distinguished Speaker Series of 2021. We have another four talks sprinkled throughout the semester. In addition, we have the um, our long-standing annual leadership summit on March 26th, which we will kick off with a keynote address by Peter Greenberg, the Emmy-winning investigative reporter and producer from CBS News. And we'll follow that up with our Icon of the Industry Award to the legendary restauranter, Danny Meyer, founder and CEO of Union Square Hospitality. Please visit the PU School of Hospitality website to note all of these dates and times. We would love to see all of you in all those events. Before I introduce Vera, uh, please know that we welcome your questions. Please feel free to type them in the chat box addressed to Professor Leora Lance. And towards the end of, if we have time, we will be very happy to ask them on your behalf to our guest today. So today I am very happy and excited to welcome someone who I consider to be the embodiment of hospitality herself. I met her for the first time in 2018 when she was here at um, Shaw for the Distinguished Speaker Series. And from the very first day, I felt a connection to her. She's warm, she's witty, she's generous, um, she's funny. And above all, she, even if you're meeting her for the first time, she makes you feel as if you've known her for years. So I believe that I'm childhood friends with her. Vera has had an impressive career. She's currently the chief operating officer of a lodging company, of the next big lodging company that most people have never heard of. Sonesta Hotels and Resorts. But before that, until last year, she was the global brand head of Hilton Hotels and Resorts. Prior to that, she was the president and chief operating officer of Denian Hospitality, a hotel group based in New York City. Prior to that, she held many positions at Starwood, including senior VP for the East Region, area managing director, and many other roles. Vera is a graduate of Riviere University in New Hampshire. She has an MBA from Southern New Hampshire University. And despite occupying such lofty positions, what I really love about Vera is that she's so down to earth. She has had an amazing career. She's risen up through the ranks. And we'll talk to her soon about it. So please help me welcome the queen of lodging, Vera Minukian. Thank you for... Um... The, the warm, warm and a, a beautiful introduction. Um, I hope I don't disappoint and uh, I, being a queen of hospitality, that's such a, uh, that's a nuance. I think I need to go find a tiara soon. Um, but anyways, I'm really so excited to be back and so humbled and grateful that you thought of me as you're putting this great program together. Um, I think this is the third time I'm speaking to the students and um, I had a lot of fun doing it. I had a lot of connections with some of um, the students and I still keep in touch with them. So um, this is a great program and I think um, the team and the students and the faculty should be very proud that um, you're doing this for them and you, you bring them different perspectives from different people in the, you know, in the industry. I wish I had that during school when I was going to school. So this is really wonderful. And again, thank you. And I'm grateful that you invited me back. So good to be here. Thank you, Vera. It's always a delight. So there are so many people that are attending today, and I think uh, the students and the faculty, as well as the young professionals and a lot of your colleagues from the industry, as well as Sinesta, we all want to get to know you, Vera. So let's start with where you were born and where did you grow up? Yeah, so I was um, I was uh, born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, I'm of a Armenian descent, but uh, Lebanese nationality. And um, you know, from many people know that Lebanon used to be uh, the Paris of the Middle East. So we were um, very happy as a family there, doing really really well, till the civil war broke out. And I lived in it for five years and saw things that really no teenager should see. 
Um, and, uh, you know, my, my parents determined after five years that, you know, our future for the kids are going to be very limited in a country that's struggling so much. So they shipped us off one at a time to come to the U.S. and uh, to start building our future. So I was 17 when I came to Boston, Massachusetts. I remember that day very clearly. Uh, I always say I came with a, my passport in one hand and a suitcase in the other filled with curiosity, anxiety, filled with a lot of dreams and uh, a lot of resilience. Um, and then I've uh, stayed in Boston for a while, lived in New York, so I'm kind of pretty much an East Coast girl. Fantastic. That is that is just such an interesting childhood. So, so what were you like as a kid? Were you a pesky kid that really irritated the parents and, and created a lot of trouble? Or were you just, okay, middle of the line and you were a good kid? So to give us a little bit sense of who you were as a kid and what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Yeah, so I, I was um, a kid that was very curious. Um, and I, I kind of uh, played under the radar and did my, um, my own thing. And I think I was the last kid on the food chain. So my parents were, you know, less focused on me and more focused on my younger siblings, my older siblings. Um, so I, I rebelled quite a bit, just like, you know, any of us who are growing up. But, um, but rebel is very different than rebelling in today's world. Um, and I always thought I would want to be a teacher. Um, I, and to this day, that part of me hasn't left me. Um, I like to mentor, I like to help um, the younger generation, the younger leaders in our industry and outside of our industry to give them advice, to coach them, to help them get through difficult situations. So I think um, I had that when you know, I was younger and it stays with me now. The role of a COO is part leadership, but also part mentor and a part teacher and a guide. So I guess that, you know, you are getting your wish. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your college days and uh, were you a good student? Did you bunk classes or um, did you wake up too late and then go to classes? And what was your favorite class in college? So this may be politically wrong and it's going to be awkward that I'm telling a dean of one of the most successful uh, hospitality uh, colleges, universities in the, in, the, in the industry that I pretty much hated school. Uh, from day one, from the minute I uh, started, whether it was kindergarten, middle school, high school, college, postgraduate, um, I just found myself to be rebelling quite a bit and actually bored. So I was, I had more curiosity to learn about life lessons versus textbooks. Um, and uh, I was a handful, um, you know, uh, to, to, to be dealt with uh, during school. But I do have to say that the couple of uh, topics that I felt very comfortable with that came very easy to me was um, chemistry and calculus and uh, differential equations. Um, I, uh, I love to solve problems and um, those courses um, gave me the ability to have the kind of the analytical part of my uh, brain work and also gave me the ability to um, solve problems and, and things of those sort, which I used to this day, that's kind of my favorite part of the job is facing issues and figuring out how do I get around them. Vera, I have already uh, kicked myself for asking you that question, uh, but you know, this-, this I don't know this if you're gonna invite me back after <laughs> telling you I hate the school, uh, but I'm you're, known for uh, being very open. <laughs> You're always going to be welcome, but I think this one thing you talked about curiosity, I think that is very important in life and career in professional and personal in every life. So I think people took note of it. Um, another very interesting facet of your personality is the languages you speak. You speak so many different languages. So can you walk us through the languages that you speak and how did you get to learn them? So it happened actually, uh, Dean, very organically, you know, because I was Armenian, I had to learn Armenian. Uh, I was born and raised in Lebanon, and so I had to learn Arabic. Um, and Lebanon was a French colony, so the second language that I was used in Lebanon naturally was French, so I had to learn French. Uh, I took English in class, so but really didn't speak it or, you know, I could read it and understand it. It was 
Uh, but obviously I had to step up when I came to the US and, and, and learn English. And um, a lot of people say I still have an accent, uh, but it comes out when I'm angry more than a normal. Typically, you know, people don't see it. And then the Turkish piece was interesting because uh, my parents, uh, when they were communicating, they both spoke Turkish fluently and they were communicating with each other. They would speak Turkish, so we don't understand. But eventually we all picked it up and learned it. So, uh, so it was a very interesting way of learning these five languages. And I have to say, it's really helped me um, navigate through my career and particularly in global roles that I've had. You know, when you speak to somebody in their native language, it's music to their ears and there's immediately that connection and immediately the removal of any typical barriers that come between when you're dealing with two, uh, uh, you know, two different cultures, people outside of the US. So it's been extremely helpful along the way. And I hope that everyone listening, particularly the students, you know, make an effort to learn other languages. It's so critical, as Vera just mentioned. Um, so I want to pivot to how you got your start in, in the lodging industry. Where did you get started from? Uh, where did you get that initial opportunity? And how did you develop the, the love for uh, this industry? Yeah, so um, I know there's many um, people in our industry and some probably on this call that didn't go to hotel school. And, and I didn't even know there was a hospitality program, actually. So um, I went to school for biology, chemistry, and math in the hopes of fulfilling my parents' dream of becoming a doctor. No, not my dream, theirs. Um, and um, so I, I, you know, I graduated with my bachelor's and started working with a doctor. And uh, that took two days to determine that I had a situation with blood going on and it wasn't a good career for me to be able to, um, that I could love. And uh, so I had the uh, difficult task of telling my parents, particularly my mom, that, I'm not going to be a doctor, but I've learned that when you have bad news for the river, you better have a plan B. Um, so then I proposed as I was delivering that news that I was going to go back and get my MBA, uh, which I did. And then uh, after graduating with my MBA with specialty in marketing, I, I remember that day very clearly. I was very broke. I was driving around uh, with my bright yellow Jetta looking for a job. And uh, I really needed gas money. And I saw a help wanted sign in front of the Sheraton Wayfarer Inn in Bedford, New Hampshire. And I think for the young ones on the phone, they're probably going help wanted sign, but that's kind of the old way of recruiting. It was, you'd have a sign outside. Um, that sign changed my life. Um, so I went in, applied um, and for anything. And um, so they gave me the role of a concierge because of obviously my language skills and my global uh, exposure. Uh, I started this part-time in an effort of finding a full-time job, uh, you know, as I'm working part-time, but um, I caught the hospitality bug and uh, I fell in love with the industry um, and I, I never looked back. Uh, I had the challenge of telling my parents that, and I was making $5 an hour. Um, and so I had the challenge uh, to tell my parents that not only I was not gonna be a doctor, but now I'm a concierge. And incidentally, concierge in Lebanon me is a doorman. So, um, so that went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> that uh, you know, the parents, no daughter of mine is gonna be opening doors after six years of college. But uh, I think they saw eventually how much I love the industry and how uh, I was blessed to excel in it. And uh, obviously we're very, very proud of my accomplishments. So, um, so yeah, so my definitely what happened was uh, not part of the plan, but uh, it fell in my lap and, um, and, I'm, and I'm so happy that um, that happened and I discovered the hospitality industry. Uh, trust me, Vera, we are all very happy that you saw the sign that way. Uh, and for the people and for the students listening, this is many years ago, and I'm, uh, obviously I won't say how many, but um, $5 an hour was a lot of money at that time. So um, Vera, a um, lot of our students are female at, in our school, and that's happening true with higher education um, worldwide. Um, and, and when you started, the work climate for women was very different than what it is today. Of course, it is not ideal today. We still have ways to go, but it was very different at that time. So can you walk us through a little bit the challenges you faced 
How did you overcome them as you were going up through the ranks to GM and beyond? So, um, you know, to this day, Dean, it drives me crazy when I go to general manager conferences and I see the sea of blue and dark gray suits and with uh, all men and a couple of females sprinkled around the room. Um, when I go to Alice conference and NYU conference, I still see that and it's really bothersome that, you know, at that senior level, we don't have enough females that representing the industry. Um, I know it has gotten much better um, since, oh, since I started in the industry. I remember when I was an EC member being the only female on the EC member. I remember I was chosen to be a general manager and I was the first female general manager in the company at 29 years old. Um, so uh, I think we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, us as leaders in the industry, we have a responsibility to help people that have the ability to be leaders to, to help them get to that level because as we get higher in an organization, there's less and less females. You see more females in marketing and in HR and maybe in sales, but when you get to GM and above, the numbers are reduced dramatically. So I think the onus is on us to really identify those candidates that would be, you would be good in that role and help them and, and remove any anxiety or obstacles to get them to that role and support them. Um, so I think we still have a lot of work to do. In terms of me personally, um, you know, I personally did not experience that glass ceiling that many other women have faced. I was very blessed. I always would, worked with people that recognized my talent, saw things in me that I didn't see, opened closed doors, gave me many different opportunities. And many times I was the first one since at the time there weren't many females. The only thing that's interesting, all of those people that supported me, encouraged me were all men. And they helped me along the way uh, to get to where I am today and rewarded my efforts. My biggest problem was women. Um, women, whether they were my age or younger and older, who were very much threatened by what was happening to me. And uh, instead of um, what typically men do, help each other and lift each other up, I was faced with a lot of scrutiny and a lot of um, questions in terms of how I got there. And um, I, I, and that's something that still resonates with me. And I think I tell the story, it's a bit personal, but uh, I remember when I first became a GM, I had an older woman walk up to me and ask me directly in front of others, who did I sleep with to get that job? And um, very painful. It was the first time I went home and cried uh, because I wasn't being um, attacked for my style or my leadership or decisions that was personal. Uh, and here I was a young girl from the Middle East who worked a very, uh, lived a very conservative life and to have to be put in that situation. Um, so I've learned though, being on the receiving end of, of those comments, um, as a woman, I've taken it very seriously to do everything in my power to help, to coach, uh, to lift other women. And I think that's something that we all collectively as females need to do a better job is, how can we support other females in the industry? How can we give them a helping hand? How can we coach them? How can we open doors for them? Again, men do such a better job at it, uh, but we have, again, a lot of work to do as female leaders, and that responsibility is very, um, I think, something very serious. And my message to all the females on the call is don't do that. Don't attack other women, help each other, um, because being on the receiving end wasn't pleasant. And um, I think we as ladies have to really rally around the younger female candidates and really, again, lift, support, encourage, and help them get through some of the difficulties that I faced uh, going through my journey in senior leadership. Well said, Vera. Thank you for that message. I think we all have an obligation and duty to work to create a, a level playing field for you know not just women but also all the minorities and everyone who um, is sort of discriminated against. So uh, thank you for that. So I think now um, I think it's time to pivot a little bit more to where you are currently, and I've just proclaimed you the queen of lodging. So let's talk about um, you know Senesta has been sort of. Um, uh, has been around for decades with a very small footprint around the nation. Um, 
and 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 you have occupied such lofty and senior positions in well-known brands and you know, and senior leaders. So, what is it about Sinesta that attracted you to come and take this position? Yeah. So, um, you know, when I got initially the call from the recruiter, I did say, "What is a Sinesta?" I remember that um, you know at the time many years ago when I was in Boston. Um, I remember there was a Sinesta hotel in Cambridge, but I never heard what happened to it. I didn't know if it closed down because I moved back to New York City after. Um, so, uh, and, and, and to make a very long process short, the recruiter asked me if I can come by to the Newton office where I am today and meet the Carlos, our CEO and uh, our HR lead from our parent company. So of course I said, yes. And in my, in my mind, I'm saying, this is not, I, I don't see myself there. I've come from Hilton, from Starwood, these big companies, and most likely my next chapter will be with another big company. And something happened during that meeting where, um, it was interesting. I really liked the conversation we had and I felt very connected to both of them. Um, and I felt the goodness and the decency and the common kind of um, the humility and being so down to earth and uh, it felt right. So I still wasn't sure. And as the conversations occurred, everyone I met on the team uh, was the same way. And um, you know, to, I've learned in life that I no longer want to work with jerks. I want to work with good people. And I've also learned in life that, you know, you may want to work, you work for a big company, but it really what matters, or a small company, whatever the case is, what matters is who you're working with every day. And, you know, is there, again, goodness there? Is there kindness there? Is there a great culture? And uh, this company has an incredible culture of putting people first and doing the right thing by them. And it, it felt good. And it felt like somewhere where I want to call as my neck of, uh, to be my next home. Um, so one thing led to another, and after meeting several people, uh, I found myself here in November. The other part that I thought was really important that played into my decision is listening to the Sinesta story and um, you know the growth that the company was projecting. So it's interesting that you know when I started in November, we were 60 hotel, close to 60 hotels. And here we are three and a half months later, we have grown by 330%. Right now we're at almost 300 hotels. So I saw the opportunity to be part of something so fantastic. You know, we're making history right now because of the fact that we're growing so quickly, but doing it during a pandemic where the, our industry unfortunately is going in one direction, and we're literally swimming against the tides and we're literally growing leaps and bounds. Um, we now have seven brands. We're in seven countries and three continents, uh, as I said, close to 300 hotels. And, you know, our industry is, you know, is struggling. And I, have, I know so many colleagues and friends that have been displaced due to COVID. However, we're hiring since I started We've, we have hired 5,500 people, so uh, which is absolutely huge. Um, and this doesn't include the red lion, inter, uh, you know, um, component, which probably will uh, hopefully will uh, consummate sometime in the middle of March. And once we have the red lion as part of our portfolio, we would have grown by 1,900%. And we would be at 1,300 hotels, 60 hotels in November, 1,300 in March. And at that point, we would be bigger than Hyatt. So, uh, which is very huge and will be the seventh largest US hospitality company. So, um, so I saw such exciting opportunity to truly build something along with Carlos and along the rest of the team, something uh, very unique, something very different. Um, and I look at this company as a startup um, because we're small and we're nimble and we're agile. And um, so it's really, really a very, very exciting time for us. And uh, I'm so happy that I made the decision and I'm just truly very excited. Thank you, Vera. And I absolutely echo your, your um, sentiments about um, Sinesta as well as Carlos. I've met so many people um, at and, and everywhere I feel the, the nice, the warm um, uh, 
uh, feeling of hospitality from that company. And, and we've had a relationship with Sonesta for quite some time. So I'm very excited that it's going to continue and very happy that you decided to take up this role. So can you talk, um, I think people don't know about Senesta. So can you talk about the different brands that you have, um, your plans for them? And particularly do mention, you know, one of the very exciting things that attracted to me, the river cruising. Yeah, so so we currently have uh, seven brands. And then with uh, one, once we um, emerge with um, Redline, we'll be up to 13 brands. So I'll talk about the seven right now. Um, so we have two full service brands, just Sinesta and Royal Sinesta. Um, Royal Sinesta caters to the upper upscale and Sinesta to the um, up, upscale. The interesting thing with Royal Sinesta is the fact that it, it, it came from luxury. We at one point, which not many people noticed, owned and operated the Plaza Hotel in New York. So, uh, which I think is huge. And uh, so, we, so we have some work to do in terms of how much of our past history we're gonna bring into the brand and, and leverage that luxury piece. Um, the Royal, the uh, Sinesta brand is, um, as I mentioned, it's the upscale and it's, it's in multiple locations as a typical full service in airports, urban, suburban. Um, and then the second brands that we have are the extended suites and the uh, extended suite, the Sinesta AS suites was built a couple of years ago. Um, and then now we have just recently launched the Simply Suites brand. So the Sinesta extended suites is catered to the um, kind of upper upscale um, um, the customers and where the Simply Suite is more for the budget conscious customer. And for the first time, Sinesta now has is swimming in the select, serve, and focus service category, which we've never done before. So we have a new brand again that we launched, the Sinesta Select, uh, that competes essentially with uh, courtyards and Hilton Garden Inns and, and Four Points and so forth. Uh, the two ones, the, there's two other brands that probably are best secrets that we have is one is the Sinesta's Cruise Connect collection, which I can't wait to go and experience. And my understanding is from what I've heard and what I've seen is that they're very high end luxury cruise lines in Egypt that um, really specialize in doing tours and historical tours about um, you know, Egypt and it's right on the Nile River. So we have another opportunity there to really expand the cruise line you know i know many of our competition were trying to do that with cruises but we've done that for years so it could put us in a very competitive advantage there and last but not least we have the posadas del inca brand which is in peru uh, one of them is in cusco which is right before machu picchu and cusco is a beautiful city if you've never been there or actually it's, i should say it's a beautiful town uh, and those hotels um, really talk about offering local experiences. It's all about experiencing Peru and the authentic Peruvian culture. So that's something that we can also tap in on the future to really go into that independent space and uh, acquire some hotels that have their true identity and leverage the, you know, their identity in the countries or in the cities that they're in. And then I'll talk more once uh, next time I'm around about the rest of the brands that we'll be acquiring. And I'm not at a liberty to do so at the moment because the deal is not finalized. Fantastic. And I think everyone was listening because uh, with this rapid expansion from 50 hotels to 300 and then going to 12 or 1300 hotels in such a short time. So eventually at the end of the day, when the history of lodging is written, I think Sonesta will occupy a very important chapter and people will soon know Sonesta around the nation. So uh, thank you for that uh, explanation about the brands, which hopefully will become household names soon. So um, what I want to ask you next, since we have so many students and young professionals, so I want to talk about uh, your career and the mentors you've had and what, who are they or what have you learned from the mentors that you've had along the way? Um, so again, I've been blessed that I've had many, many mentors along the way. Some are, were, um, one of our owners is one of my closest mentors. And uh, I've had others that who were my bosses that have been my mentors. I think it's so important to the young students that are on this call is um, to really, I, to, to work with mentors and identify some mentors that um, you, know, you feel comfortable with and there's chemistry there. 
um, you know, mentors have played such a big role in my life and with many of others that I know, um, you know, especially when you're trying to make difficult decisions, they help you kind of lift that fog and see things more clearly. Good mentors ask tough questions and that's things that you really should think about and maybe know the answer by trying to avoid the answer. Um, good mentors, you know, look at, point out things that you're doing wrong or you're handling wrong and maybe have better suggestions for you to handle. Um, they have helped me solve problems, helped me to take a step back and when I'm in a situation where it's stressful and there's conflict that, um, you know, you take a look back and put yourself in the other person's shoes. So, um, and when this, even when this opportunity came with Sinesta, it was my, one of my closest mentors who really guided me through and helped me kind of sort out some of the questions that I had and ask questions to me. Uh, they don't necessarily give you the answer, but ask questions that you start thinking about things that you may have not uh, thought about. Um, and, I've, and I've had that throughout my career. And, um, and I always like to give back because um, that has helped my growth um, and my success so much that I like to always give back and be a mentor to anyone and um, get male, female, or whatever they are at the stage of career, because I think it's such an important part of, um, you know, your growth and, 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 and learning from errors and really seeing things that you probably don't see on your own. Vera, um, since we do have students and young professionals on the call with us, what kind of um, advice would you give to them who are just starting out or about to enter our industry? What is the best advice you've received and you know, uh, how did that impact you? So, um, you know, I've received so much advice from so many people, but the ones that I constantly think about that kind of come to play regularly, um, one is to listen to your inner voice when things are happening and especially when you're facing difficult situation, that inner voice is usually right and don't ignore it. Um, secondly, I've learned from one of my tough, tough bosses I had is that a zebra is not gonna change its price, uh, right? even if you paint it. That eventually the paint's gonna wear off and the colors, the zebra stripes are gonna come out. So if you have a problem, don't wish it's gonna go away. Don't hope things are gonna change when you know they're not. Sometimes they do, but recognize the time when they are not gonna change and make your decisions accordingly. And the best advice I always got was from my mom, uh, who was my biggest mentor and biggest role model, who always said, don't let anybody or anything scare you. Just believe in God and uh, only fear God. And, and when I go through some difficult situations, I remember those words and um, it gives me courage and it gives me confidence um, when things are tough. Thank you, Vera. And I hope uh, everyone was taking note. Um, at this point, I and know then, that many- um, yes. Actually, Dean, if I made the second part of the question, which was, I'm sorry, I didn't answer the second part, I will do so, is about giving advice to, you know, to, to, the, to our young leaders that are on the call or potential leaders on the call. There's five things I wanna tell them. Number one is learn, learn, learn. Be a sponge. As you have opportunities thrown at you, especially early in the career, take it all in. Say yes, um, and then just learn as much as possible because all these learnings are gonna go in the toolbox that you're gonna use one day as you're growing in your career. Secondly, the curiosity piece that I talked about, always be curious, always ask questions, don't settle. Good enough isn't good enough. And always ask why, when, especially when people say, we can't change because we've always done it that way. But don't just ask why, ask why not. Um, and, 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 and don't give up, keep pushing and pushing, pushing along. Um, number three, I think uh, being adapted to change. And what this year has taught us is that you know, our lives turned upside down in so many different ways. And we, many of us adapted and some didn't. And I think it's real important that, you know, in my over 30 year career, I've seen, I've changed companies, I've changed leaders, I've changed brands. And uh, the, the, the folks that deal with change uh, with an open mind and adapt are the ones that make it. Uh, the folks that are stuck in their ways and refuse to change are the ones that really struggle. 
So be willing to change and be willing to adapt and be willing to learn new things of, of, of doing things and reinventing yourself. Um, the fourth thing that um, I, I wanna tell remind people is that build relationships. Relationships are so important in life and in particularly in our industry. Uh, relationships with your teams, relationships with your colleagues, relationship with your owners, relationship with your vendors. It's all about relationships. And when you build those, uh, life is much easier when you know you can count on somebody and you know that that person is not going to let you down and they're going to be there for you when in time of need. And last but not least, Dean, I, I, there's a quote I've used before when I was at, when I was at your school and um, that kind of uh, inspires me. And, and some people are probably going to say, think it's like from Gandhi or it's from uh, Winston Churchill or Eisenhower or Lincoln. It's actually from someone who's probably a very terrible role model, and that is Mike Tyson. Um, but he has a line that he uses that says, uh, everyone has a plan till you get punched in the face. And um, I think many of you probably agree um, that we've all been punched on the face many, many times uh, and our plans have been altered. Um, so my uh, recommendation is that, or what the way I've gone through it as being on the receiving end is, as tough as that is, uh, you have to get up and you can't stay on the floor. And as, and, and as tough as that is, you need to dust yourself off and put the band-aids on the wounds and the cuts you receive even if it causes a setback, because sometimes I think a setback is a setup for the next stage in your life. And the, and, and the key is to really keep moving and keep plugging away and keep plowing through it. Because with the end of the day, you're gonna realize as I have many times is that you're stronger, a lot stronger than you think you are. You know, I, I think with that response, um, first of all, I was just so happy to, you know, your learning and curiosity. I mean, those are things that we try to inculcate here. But I think um, one of the hallmarks of a true leader is that you can draw lessons from anywhere and anyone. And there is a possibility that Mike Tyson was talking literally when he said that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And you might have been talking about a boxing metaphor that, you know, but Vera, you have now taken that and applied it to your life and to, you know, sort of taken that figuratively. I think that's a very important lesson. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, at this point, I am, I know that a lot of questions have been coming up. So I am going to hand it over. I'm gonna take a short break while I go and make a booking in that river cruise that where I was talking about. And I'm gonna hand it over to Professor. Fantastic, we'll do that. And while I hand over to Professor Leora Lance so that she can ask the questions that have been coming in the chat box, I'll be back in a little while. Thank, Thank you. you, Dean of Major. Thank you, Vera, for being with us today. And it's your advice from the last few minutes that has gotten the chat box going haywire um so and there are a number of questions that have come in so thank you for joining us at school today and thank you for the community school and industry friends who are joining us today to hear from you everyone is super excited to hear about you and learn about you and and here's Sinesta's news this is exciting for all of us in the industry and we're across the river so we're really really thrilled um, maybe a river cruise on the Charles, that would be kind of fun. <laughs> I never know. You never know. Uh, I never know. But the boxing metaphor definitely sparked um, some input. And someone actually did ask, how do you uh, get punched and, and move forward to, to, to not get punched again? I know how I would answer that, but how would you answer that? Um, you know, you can't avoid the punches, Leora, because, um, you know, it's, it's, you have plans and you think you're going to do something and life happens right um personally and professionally you know there's adversities you face personally of things that happen to your family or to yourself and then in always in life you meet people that possibly have different intentions than you and maybe not good intentions um so I don't believe there's a way to avoid the punches because they're going to happen and you're going to fall into whether it's your boss or your colleague you're going to get into these difficult situations and 
really what's important is to get through it and not to let that individual or that situation, as I said, set you back where it paralyzes you and it stops you from moving forward because then they won. Uh, and the best way to do that is really, even if you need to get help and even if you need to get support, but it's really, it's that resiliency of saying, I am not, I've worked too hard and I've given too much to allow the situation to hijack me and stop me from where I'm heading. It's not easy. And it's definitely not easy. And sometimes it takes time. I, I know from, you know, many of the punches I've received is that sometimes it takes time and it takes healing uh, to get through it. But eventually you have to find the resources um, you get to get the help. You have to have the support to get through it. Not everyone can do it alone. Everybody's different. And the, the level of the pain that the punch causes is very, very different. It's, it's especially if it's personal. Um, and, you know, um, so I think, you know, just again, getting up and going. And even if you're limping along, that eventually you're going to walk and eventually you're going to run. Thank you for that. Thank you for that very, very much. Very inspiring. I, I can tell you, Vera, that your messages of resiliency and persistence also really struck a nerve with many folks because I'm getting lots of comments in the chat about that as well. And some words of appreciation to you for telling and engaging, uh, inspiring women to please support each other and, and stop that sort of attacks and, and whether it's jealousies or other things, but that definitely was another message that struck accord with many who are with us today. So thank you for that. There were a couple of business related questions that um, have come through some from our students that I want to ask, and then we'll get to more of the personal questions if that's okay. But with, with the business ones, uh, one of our students had asked, it's one of our seniors, Kyle, I'm going to point you out on this one. You know, with uh, Sinesta's growth and the brands that are going to grow, how do you feel about the proliferation of brands in our business? Are there too many brands is, and I'm not sure if you can talk to this, but will Sinesta merge some of the brands? Will it continue to expand some of the brands? What's your thoughts on all the brands that we, we see in lodging today? So actually that's a very good question because I think that um, there's so many brands that overlap that sometimes, you know, um, in different categories, let's talk about full service for instance, that it kind of, uh, sometimes you walk into a hotel and if you cover the sign and you wonder which hotel are you in, you know, which full service, which company's hotel are you in? Are you in a Marriott and a Hilton and a Hyatt? Um, so there's quite a bit of a challenge of being part of the sea of sameness that, um, you know, uh, that, that it's just, it's all kind of starts to look the same and feels the same. The opportunity that we have with Sinesta and, um, and whatever the kind of the whiteboards that I see is that we have the opportunity to build something really uh, unique, something really different, something really pre differentiated. And I think that's what our customers are looking for. They're, they're looking for those unique experiences. They're looking for things that kind of resonates with them. And, you know, um, one of the things that we have to work on and we're working on is really defining what our brands stand for and how are we gonna differentiate ourselves. So we have a lot of work to do there and we started to do that. To really identify who that target customer is and what kind of services and what kind of experiences are they looking for. Most importantly, what were they gonna pay for, right? Um, so I think that so we have a unique opportunity to do that here. Uh, and because of the fact that we're starting from scratch, we don't really have some perceptions about the brand that we need to overcome. Our opportunity is to create awareness because not everyone, even though we're making uh, several headlines about Sonesta, but I think most of it is within the industry. So we have an opportunity to create awareness of a Sonesta brand and really explain what do we stand for and what does the different brands stand for. Secondly, we need to work on consideration. So it's great that people know what Sinesta is, but we really want them to consider us to stay there. And thirdly, we want to build loyalty. So therefore we want them to come back and, and really seek us out. Um, some of the things that um, also I want to touch base on full service, as I mentioned, it's becoming such a sea of sameness and, and really different to, to, to pull the, the brands apart. You know, we here at Sinesta, we feel we have a huge, huge opportunity to really reposition our full service brands because I think they're gonna look very differently post COVID. And um, so, you know, it's a huge 
a part for us to really think of innovative ideas to say, listen to what the customers want and come up with things, but even things such as meetings and events, you know, it's going to look very differently than it did in 19. Is it, is it, is the hybrid model going to continue? Is that long-term? What kind of food and beverage activations are the customers looking for now, given the sensitivity around COVID? So I think the full service was struggling to begin with for prop, you know, not for Sinesta, for overall as a category. And now, but I do think that we have, we can push the reset button and say, what does a full service mean? And, 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 and how do we reinvent ourselves and, and doing things differently? That's, it resonates with our target customer. And I think that's actually refreshing for our students to hear about, okay, we're, we've learned something from the last year. Now, where, where do we go with this? So I think it's right. great to hear that Sinesta is thinking that way. We did get another um, business-related question. I do want to get to the personal, but the business-related question is pigging back, uh, pigging back, piggybacking off of what you just shared about the experiences. And the question is, do you anticipate that these experiences and maybe the full service experiences that you just alluded to, um, will it go toward all-inclusive? Will it go toward resorts? Where do you see Sinesta um, sort of taking these experiences? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we, based on our new, um, you know, acquisition that we have, we have so many resorts now that we, we're playing in fields that we didn't play in before. So, um, so we have, we always had Hilton Head, but now we have Kauai, now we have um, San Juan in Puerto Rico. So we're, we're kind of expanding, you know, our portfolio. I think, um, you know, from the research that we've done over the years that, you know, people want to go somewhere where they really, you know, it's like, if, if I go to a hotel in, in Chicago and if I go to a hotel in Hong Kong and it's the same building, the same design, the same thing, that cookie cutter approach, it doesn't really, customers don't want that. Customers want to know if they are in Hong Kong, they want to feel what the experience is. That should be reflected in the design from the first minute they walk in. It should be reflected in the food and beverage component. It should be reflected in every touch point where you know what country that you're in and really have the ability to kind of experience some of the authentic local cultural pieces. And also have our teams, uh, you know, it used to drive me crazy when our customers New York, you have an international shopper or someone, you know, any shopper, they say, you know, where should I go? And they say, oh, Bloomingdale's or Saks Fifth Avenue. And I'm like, Ugh. you know, how, how can we point them out to these special, unique stores in New York that, you know, that, that people love and these local areas that we can, or the local restaurants, so they can experience the authentic New York versus, you know, the Bloomingdale's, any part of the country and experiences. So I think, you know, in, in a lot of the experiences, in a lot of the research we did, Leora, we saw that today's customers are looking for, uh, are really kind of teed up to spend less on things and more on things to do. This was pre-COVID, right? So they really want to create those memories and they really want to do something different and special. And pre-COVID, I think travel and global travel was exploding. So I think that's where the opportunity that we have. You've, you've traveled a lot in your life. So here's some of the personal questions. There we go. Are you aisle seat or window? I, I like to be in control. <laughs> <laughs> what items do you travel with that you just can't leave home without? My flat iron. Your flat iron. <laughs> Okay, spoken like a woman executive. Um, best travel tip for when you travel? Any advice for travel? Um, you know, even when you're on business, I do this really well. When I try, when I, my least recent role before uh, Sinesta, I you know I traveled globally extensively. I always made time to explore the city I was in. So even if I was on business, I kind of hacked my business trip and added a personal component to it. So if you have an ability to go somewhere, um, try to add a day or two. And again, don't go to Bloomingdale or Saks. Go to these authentic places where you can experience the country. You learn so much. I think, you know, another note maybe that you will like is that the experiences that you have when you're on the road and understanding people's culture, no textbook does gives justice to that, you know, and then experiencing the food and it just makes you such a more a person with such a different global perspective. It's it's really a great, great um, experience that you'll have and it will stay with you. 
you know, you have traveled so much, Vera, where, where would you like to vacation or where have you not been that you, that's on a bucket list for you perhaps? Yeah. So, um, my favorite place to vacation is, um, this little village that's called as easy E, which is, uh, I don't know if you've been there, but it's, it's been, but a beautiful medie medieval village. I like things that are not modernized. I like things that have kind of stayed more authentic, true to the, you know, to, to, to the culture and the country that it that it's in. It's in southern France. It's between Nice and Monaco. And it's just when you're there, you're constantly in and out about the beauty, uh, about there's no cars allowed, so you have to walk around everywhere. Um, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful place. It's like a safe haven. Um, the other place that is that I really loved and enjoyed going there is Sardinia in Italy. Uh, just such a such a beautiful, beautiful jewel place that not everyone has discovered. And also, I was surprised when I went to Hanoi, Vietnam, um, how much I fell in love with um, Vietnam. It was uh, the hospitality from the people, whether it was the cab driver or the food vendor on the street, just genuinely nice people that made me feel uh, very welcome and I enjoyed, I enjoyed the experience um, there That's for nice. sure. That's nice. yeah. Speaking of foods, do you cook? Do you bring in? Uh, I definitely don't cook at all and I have no desire to learn and uh, I bring in, <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not perfect so I bring There's in. There's no, why is that perfect? A lot of people bring in. There's a lot of good restaurants yeah. to bring in from. Right. And on the right. weekends do, or when you have time to yourself, what's sort of a guilty pleasure? What do you like to do to relax? So I like to work out, um, spend time with family and friends and, um, you know, and, and, and travel when I can actually, you know, even to take this small staycations, like going to Nantucket and do that. I, I just like to explore and like to go, um, you know, and find things and do things and continuously learn. That that comes the curiosity piece always plays in a part of in what I do. Yeah, yeah. And have you, are you reading anything lately? Have you had a chance to read anything? Or, or is there a book that you're into or uh, what, so, what do you yes. So typically, I'm a little different than probably any other executive. I, I read a lot of spiritual books. So um, what I'm reading versus how to lead books where, you know, I still do that. But uh, uh, I, I read a lot of Joel Osteen's books and he's a preacher. So uh, the one I'm reading now is Empty Out the Negative. I find that he provides me with food for the soul and, and helps me um, kind of be the best that I can be. Uh, empty out the negative is very interesting because and particularly now during COVID times, I think so many, you know, things occupy your brain space with negative energy or worry or concerns and what ifs and all these issues that we're facing. And I think, uh, you know, that book is helping me kind of um, purge all the negative thoughts and we have the kind of the ability to replace them with positive thought, thoughts and look at the things half full versus half empty. So, uh, and then, as I said, he, I think he provides food for the soul, which I feel is very useful to me. I think empty out the negative is one of the best pieces of advice. Just standing on alone, that title is just such a great piece of advice for everybody. So, um, yeah, because it's, you know, negativity, uh, it's amazing what happens in your brain. And sometimes it's not even the reality, but you build your, reali your reality in the brain. And it sometimes shatters confidence, takes the, the fun away from life. And, um, you know, and, and it's just, it's counterproductive. Um, so I think learning how to really get, and it's going to happen, right? We're all human. We're all going to have insecurity. So it's kind of, how do you get rid of that and not let it take over your life? I find that it's, it's, it's beneficial. Yeah. We have another question that just popped in. Do you have a favorite or can you recall a favorite guest interaction that you may have had over the years? Um. I had a very negative interaction that turned into positive, if, if, if I may. So I had started at one of our hotels um, in, and I was uh, the area managing director, but based out, out of a hotel in New York. And it was, I think my third or fourth day. Um, and it, and it kind of, it, it's a lesson in terms of how you deal with problems. And um, so it was this gentleman who was uh, going through a divorce and was staying at that hotel with his uh, girlfriend. Uh, 
and um, the wife who apparently um, um, was uh, they had issues or there was things and she had a he she ha he had a restraining order against her and our uh, night auditor uh, she, because she went in and said I'm the wife and gave him access gave her access to the room with their 11 year old child uh, they walked into the room and um, obviously they were you know the, the gentleman was having um, intercourse with his girlfriend and his 11 year old saw that and uh, so and it's um but those are the things that we faced and I remember when the next day you know um the, and it, it kind of taught me how to face problems face on I, I sat with him having breakfast with his girlfriend they had breakfast I couldn't I was sick to my stomach couldn't eat and I said what can I do for you and I said I am appalled I don't know what I, I, I don't know I wish I could buy you lunch or breakfast or a burger to make all this go away and I think he saw the sincerity and he saw that, you know, I was there to do whatever he needed to, like whatever he needed. And, and you know, he asked me, are you gonna pay for my child's therapy? And because of that's how devastating it was. And it may be a bit of a drastic story, but, and those are the things that we faced. And because of me staying in contact with that guest and ensuring all was okay, even said, you know, I can help you from a legal perspective to tell you how the hotel can assist to this day, that guest is in touch with me. So um, it's a perfect way of really being empathetic, sympathetic, having compassion with a, with a, in a, during a problem because people are people, you know, and they can see that a person genuinely cares. So um, so that's a, that, that was a pretty dramatic story that, turned, that we went through. I'm giving you the very short version, but uh, it was extremely bumpy and tells you that, you know, mistakes are gonna happen. Humans are gonna make the wrong decision. It's how we recover and it's how we tackle the situation would make the difference. And I can only imagine why that is such a memorable guest interaction and experience. And it's interesting because when the gentleman who's uh, joining us now who asked that question, I was thinking myself and those kinds of things are usually the most memorable interactions or recovery situations. You know, right. it's how did we fix something that didn't go right, but how did we turn it into you know, a silver lining and a long-term positive situation. And boy, that was a tough one, but um, clearly a memorable one. But we face all kinds of situations in hotels, don't we now? So right. it right. is it is a backdrop for lots of things to happen. Um, and it may have been at the same hotel in New York where I had my recovery experience for all we know. So um, things happen at hotels, but it's up to us to learn how to, to be human and be hospitable and, and, and be genuine about it. So that clearly is what helped with that recovery. Absolutely. Well, we're actually at the 1130 mark. So I wanna turn it back to Dean of Naja at this point to wrap, but Vera, thank you. Thank you for sharing, for, for being so honest and sharing your candor and all these experiences with us and being here with our industry and our students. And I'm gonna turn it back to Dean of Naja to wrap up. Thank, thank you, you Laura. Thanks, Vera. Thank you, Leora, and and um, th that story Vera perfectly illustrates um, our industry and all the experiences and the good and the bad and what you learn from them and how do you recover from them. Uh, so what I want to say at this point, Vera, is that people who come to speak at our distinguished speaker series one time are considered honored guests, but those who come more than once become part of the Shah family, and so. I could formally thank you, but you're part of the Shah family. I've known you all my life. Um, one doesn't thank fam family members for visiting, but I have to say it is always so much fun to talk to you and I end up learning so much from everything you have to say. And I, and I hope that everyone listening today enjoyed listening as well as came away with a sense of excitement that you have for our industry. Um, thank you to all the faculty and staff for, for attending today as well as um, for helping out. I want to call out uh, Charlie, Leora, and Mara for all their help. And in particular, I really want to thank everyone who's attended today and spent an hour with us. Uh, thank you for giving us that time, really appreciate it. And uh, we welcome everyone to our next Dean's Distinguished Lecture on March 12th. And I know that the, um, the ultimate marketing machine, Robert Earl, 
and his son, Robbie Shaw 2015, they'll be on. And I know that they'll be very excited to hear your answer, Vera, that you dine in all the time because they are shaking up the world of virtual dining wow. through their multiple concepts, including Mariah Carey cookies and Mr. Beast burgers. So Robert and Robbie have launched more than half a dozen celebrity themed virtual dining concepts. Is this the future of dining and food delivery? Find out what they have to say on March 12th, same time. Until then, stay safe and healthy, and I hope you get to enjoy some leisure time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye.